All right, all set. The chair notes the time is 6.02. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Here. Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Here. A quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Rob Wachilla, planner for the town, Christine Brestrup, planning director, and Mr. Rob Mora, building com commissioner. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarifications or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing pound nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda, consideration of minutes from uh, October 19th and November 2nd, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit, <clears throat> excuse me, a comprehensive, comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B, to construct 30 owner occupied affordable residential units located in 15 structures, parking areas, and 58 spaces, common areas, and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested waivers from the zoning bylaws, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, sewer water connections approvals at 2040 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN, Neighborhood Residential and RLD low residential, low density residential zoning districts and FC farmland conservation overlay zoning district. This is continued from our hearing on November 2nd. Following that, there's general com public comment period on matters before the board, not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within 48 hours and adjournments. Tonight's first order of business is consideration of minutes from two, two previous meetings the first is October 19th, 2023. And Ms. Greenbaum, I know you had some changes you'd like to see to the minutes. Do you want to describe those or have they, have you talked with just, about them? They were just errors, a couple of words. And then the rest, um, where Rob had used initials, I spelled out the word because 20 years from now, somebody may not know what that is. Do you have those in? I, I, I've reviewed them and I have no problem with them, but uh, Rob, do you have? Um, yeah, I do. And I can screen share them. Screen. Real, I can screen yeah. share them really quickly. Um, yeah. I'll just give me one second. All right. I know so, I wouldn't have said a hundred percent because I know better. Which is fine. And um, I think this just 
this was an oversight when the minutes were being done. Um, and I think yeah. it's good that we spell out some of the, the acronyms. And this one, usually they call it a and the state level, but it's also good to have this in parentheses here. And then um, I'll make these changes accordingly um, once the board approves the minutes tonight. So that's that's basically all the comments that Hilda submitted. Um, Great. Yeah. Great. Good catches. Um, any other comments or suggestions for the minutes? If there's no other comments or suggestions um, and no other discussion, I'd entertain a motion that we approve the minute from the minutes of the, the, the October 19th, 2023 meeting. Do I have such a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? There's no discussion. The vote occurs on approving the minutes. I vote aye, Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Minutes are approved. My vote is 5-0. Uh, the second is minutes of the November 2nd, 2023 meeting. Again, Hilda, you had, Ms. Greenbaum, you had a couple of changes. Um, I don't remember well, what they were. Yeah, I, look, I also reviewed those. Those seem to be pretty much technical. Um, but I think if you have them, you should share them with the board, Rob. So actually, um, I just show them to you. So she combined both both of them to the same document. But I'll sh I'll share them again just for a few seconds. Right. So down here are the that changes. That was November second. Yeah. Yeah. So this You're is right. when she, you know, the A and R, and then um, adding some words there. But that's pretty much it. Um, I'm assuming there's no objection. Are there any other changes? And without objection, we'll approve the min. Uh, there, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes as amended by. Um, Ms. Greenbaum, do I have such a motion? So moved. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right, it's moved and seconded. I'm assuming there's no discussion. The vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Vote is 5 0. Motion carries. Minutes are approved as amended. Um, next order of business is consider is um, the application before us tonight, ZBA FY 2024 20, uh, 03 Valley Community Development Corporation request for a special a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B. Are there any dis uh, disclosures by members of the board? If not, uh, submissions, we've received, I think, just one email um, on November 4th from a Mary Krauss, an email in support of the project. We've also received a memo from Chris Brestra, planning, our planning director, detailing comments and questions from the planning board's meeting about this. And I think you've all received that or it was in the, uh, in the meeting packet. Um, I, don't, I think that's it, isn't it? Rob, there's nothing else that we... So uh, the only other thing is I updated the project application report, but an update is just changing a few things on one page, um, but yeah. it has been updated accordingly. And then um, the materials that will be presented tonight have already been submitted to the board in their first meeting packet on the uh, October 19th meeting. So yeah. I believe the plans that we're going to see um, the board already has and are already available on the top Amherst website. Got it. Mm -hmm. So tonight um, our topics are architecture and mechanical systems. Um, future meetings on December 7th, we're gonna talk about stormwater management and stormwater infrastructure. On December 21st, it's property management, income restrictions, financials, the application selection process and local preference. And then on January 4th, waivers, conditions and findings, if we're able to get everything done in time for that. But we can talk about schedule further, but at the, this point in time, this is the, uh, the schedule for the hearings on the 40B. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do is, unless there's any questions about process, turn it over to the applicant to um, introduce who's going to speak on your behalf tonight, Ms. Alan, and we'll um, please ask everybody who's going to speak, identify yourself, and give your address for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening. My name is Jessica Allen. I am real estate project manager at Valley Community Development. 
Um, tonight, as we're talking about the building design and the mechanical systems with that building design, I'm going to turn the majority of the pre presentation over to Tom Chalmers, who's with Austin Design Cooperative out of Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, and he has a presentation that he's going to walk through some information. Um, and if I understand correctly, it's the preference of the board for him to go through the presentation and then the board will ask questions at the end of the presentation. And that's the best way to do it, unless there's something that absolutely has to be clarified. It's some ways confusing, but okay, sounds more good. Detailed, more detailed questions than that. It's easiest if we wait till the end. Sure, sounds perfect. So yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Tom, and I believe hopefully he's got the ability to share his screen so that he can share his presentation. Yep. Awesome. So thank you. Hi, hi everybody. I'm Tom Chalmers from Austin Design. Um, our office is in Brattleboro, Vermont. I live in uh, Gill, Mass, and I will. I think I can just share this uh let's see you should be seeing a does everybody see that slideshow yes no. okay great um so i have a i put together a uh powerpoint that has some kind of additional material that that is that was in the packet just to be able to talk about um, some more specific details on the buildings and the mechanical systems, then I can send you a copy of this after. Um, so I'll start off, um, this is just the site plan, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, it Here, I just want to start off to indicate, show you basically that there's four different building types there's uh, a building type A and a building type B, and then there's building type C and D. And before we get into some details on those, I just thought I would go into a little bit about how, how we got there. Um, as, as I think architects are trained to make everything more complicated than it needs to be, so try to start off being very simple. Um, we had, I'll just list a couple of design goals we had, which is to be able to have a, a simple building that supports the variety in size, two and three bedroom, supports variety in appearance and massing, has efficient, is efficiently built, um, will be cheap to maintain and operate, and will support passive and PV solar. We start So we started out with a very simple rectangular box, 20 by 30 feet, dimensions that support um, Basically, the basic uses that are needed on the on the ground floor, plus the staircase and bedrooms above. The second basic box was um, more of a rectang more of a square shape, and that was to to accommodate um, accessible uh, features and clearances. So, with that basic box, we can combine them into <clears throat> we can make one and a half or uh, we can wait one and a half two bedroom units or with a full story two full two story three bedroom unit um, in plan we came up with trying to maximize as much as possible without getting too long a building the solar frontage so we have a a um, down at the bottom here we have a a uh, I would actually let's take the middle one. We have we combined a one and a half story with a two story. There's a a link area in between, and then a third uh, criteria enters, which is the passive solar and the entrance from the street. So, and those those don't coincide depending on which side the building is on the street. So the the unit type A has a southern entrance, um, and unit type B is basically the same as A except we're entering from the north and we're um, exploiting the southern exposure for living areas. So while the massing is similar, the interior design is a little bit different. And then looking at the section, um, in combining these, we have a, a the two story, the link, and the one story. And we have the one and a half story, the link, and the one story. And that's building D and building C is basically the same as building D. Um, combining all these together, we have we came up with 30 homes 
Um, they're all duplexes. So there's 15 duplexes. We're emphasizing passive solar design. We have 18 two bedrooms, 12 three bedrooms, um, four building types, as I mentioned, A through D. Six of the homes are two bedroom on one story. So they're fully accessible. All the homes are what we call visitable, which means that the doorways are wide enough for wheelchair and there's clearances to move around. Um, each home will have its individual photovoltaic system. And then there's this table here, which gives square footage, which probably can't see at this level, but um, basically uh, the two bedroom units, I mean, the two bedroom homes are, you know, roughly uh, a thousand, a little over a thousand square feet, the three bedroom, 1200 square feet, and the accessible units are a little bigger at, um, at the building at 2000, at about 1,100 square feet for a two bedroom. So just to look a little bit more detail in, in building type A, you can see that we have the one and a half story on the left side here, the two story on the right side, there's a porch in between. Building B is, this is a, the rear view of, <clears throat> this is the north. So this is looking at the south view of building A which is also the entrance. This is looking at the north view of building B, which is the entrance. And then the um, building C and D are quite different. They have a, a one story wing for the accessible unit. And the difference between C and D basically is that uh, there's a one and a half story on the left versus a two story. And the two story again gives three bedroom, the one and a half, story gives um sorry the two story gives three bedroom yeah the one and a half story gives two bedroom okay this is i'm gonna look at two floor plans just to get into a little bit of detail um this is building a ground floor the left side here is the uh two bedroom unit which is one and a half stories and the right side is the three bedroom, two, two full stories. So they have um, down at the bottom of the page would be the, the main spine street. They have a walks that come up. They share a common entry area covered with a porch. Um, they have their own spaces defined by a, a kind of picket type fence. It gives a little bit of possibility for seating on the porch or putting stuff there that's separate from your neighbor. They have an entry and a mudroom. Uh, in the mudroom will be one of the mechanical system elements, which will be the uh, heat pump water heater. Otherwise, it's open for storage and coats hanging, et cetera. The red walls here, the, the separation between the units. Behind, <clears throat> behind the um, mudroom is a storage area that's accessed from the outside. Within the house, we have an open plan floor plan with a lot of light on the south side here. Um, it's not equal. There's obviously this has a longer exposure than this one. We extend this window towards the east or west a little bit more to pick up some of this. Um, there's a living area. There's an open stair that runs up to the second floor. There's an open kitchen dining area and a half bath on the ground floor that includes a laundry equipment. And then each of the units in addition to that has a rear patio door that takes them out to a private patio. Um, this drawing is showing some mechanical systems in terms of what's on the exterior. There'll be a walk linking these. This is going to be a condenser for the mini splits inside. And this is space allocated for electrical panel and um, for solar equipment. On the second floor, we come up uh, come up the stairs. There's a hallway that's open to the stair. This is the uh, two bedroom unit, one and a half story. Um, because the roof comes down on these, we have bedrooms are located on the end of the building. And then there's full bath and there's closets and there is a space that can be accessed under the eaves on the side. 
And finally, they have a storage area that borders between the two units. This one on the right side is the three bedroom. So this has a master bedroom and two other bedrooms along the south side. Again, bathroom, storage area. <laughs> the master bedrooms are about 130 square feet and the um, secondary bedrooms are right around 100 square feet each. This is a quick uh, early model sketch of the building. Um, again, we have large windows on the south side. We have awnings to protect uh, the summer sun, the high summer sun from getting in and overheating the house too much. Those will be calibrated for size. We'll be doing shading studies, et cetera, to figure out exactly how, how far they should extend and how close they should be to the glass. Um, all these buildings are at grade. There's no foundation. The walks will will be all uh, flush, so that you know wheelchair can just roll right into the to the building. There's no steps. Even though this shows a little bit of lip, but there'll be no steps. Um, they have asphalt roofing, solar panels on the roof. Um, siding is going to be hardy. Uh, siding, cement board siding, and we have a number of different. Uh, materials that we're combining and various things. There's basic, the most of it is, this is showing clapboards. And then there's also some board and batten accents to break things up. Um, we also will probably use some hardy shingles at some locations. Um, usually on these projects, we're, install, we're using hardy standard colors and not painting the siding, um, which, the, which saves considerably in cost. This is more of a straight on exterior elevation. Um, you can see that in the, <clears throat> this is the south side of building A, larger windows. Um, on the east or west side, depending on how the building is oriented, we include, we cover, continue some of the larger windows on this smaller unit. Uh, this is the north side with minimal windows. And here you can see the, um, storage doors in the link above. So building C and D, I, I guess I'm showing you building D here. Um, the difference between C and D is, is only the uh, whether or not the two-story unit has two bedrooms or three bedrooms. Um, this one is a three bedroom, so it's a full two-story. It's similar to the other units to the to building A, um, it's on the right side here, the accessible unit where we see some pretty big differences, and they're mostly all have to do with, uh, you know, providing clearance for uh, wheelchair users to move around. So, uh, coming in entrance is the same. You can come in. There's uh, an open plan here, and then. A wide hallway that comes down leads to one bedroom that is is sized for a wheelchair. There's a second smaller bedroom. There's a, a wide hall that comes down to a washer dryer, which also has a turning radius here. And then we also include a since it's all one story, we include a utility room over here. The, there's a mud room which is accessible, and then there's a second half bath which is not. And uh, again, building C and D are basically the same. There's some dip variation in where the patio is on site, uh, but otherwise it's the same. On the second floor, obviously over the one story, there's just roof. Um, and the, the uh, second floor here is, is, is similar to the A or the B. In this case, you know, the storage area happens to be larger. And this isn't full. This looks larger than it is because it's not full ceiling height. It's a roof, sloping roof that, so the full standing height is probably more in the middle. And these are some model views. This is the, this is the two story link and the, and here's some elevations. And again, you can see the majority of the windows are on the south side. 
uh, in this in the C and the Ds, we 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 did the building is longer, um, and so we really we have pretty equal southern orientation on the on the windows. Here's just a quick diagram looking at uh, roof height. So the 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 uh, peak height is at 27 foot nine. That's pretty consistent, I think, through all the buildings. And per zoning, the average height would be at 23 foot for the highest two story. Um, it's a quick drawing, probably difficult to see, but th these are three building sections, wall sections. Um, the short one here on the left is the is a, the one story piece. Uh, the other middle one is the one and a half story piece. And then the one on the right is the two story piece. And so basically the construction is that there's a reinforced insulated frost wall. There's an insulated slab on grade. It's two by six framing filled with cellulose. And then there's one inch of rigid insulation on the exterior. The floors are eye joists. Second floor is uh, the same framing. And then there's roof trusses, which you see here um, for the roof. Here are a couple of building sections, which again are a little bit on the small side. One thing I wanted to point out is that um, we're we're ex experimenting with trying to well one of the things that's difficult in these small houses is where to locate uh, mechanical equipment and I'll get into that in more detail in a minute but um, when you have to run duct work you really want to try to keep it within the heated envelope and not within the exterior envelope which would be the insulated section of this roof so we've been working with some trust manufacturers to come up with a, a trust design which in this case would uh, would give us space in here below the, the red and would have a drop ceiling and there we could have our ERV equipment in here and run ductwork around this without and without keeping without getting into the uh, into the joist space into the cold air of the attic. Um, as single family homes these do not need to be or duplexes they do not need to be sprinkler. Um, we have working with CET to come up with an energy efficiency plan, which looks at both building envelope, uh, mechanical systems, appliances. Our goal is to reach um, a mass save electric level one. It's going to be all electric building with no fossil fuels. Um, and to do that, we need to reach HERS ratings, these HERS ratings. I think it's a 45 or less. So. With the based on preliminary uh, the preliminary design, we're getting these HERS ratings for the units, and we can. I don't know if I need to go through this in detail, but it basically repeats some of the stuff I've said before about the framing. Um, these buildings are very tight, and they will, of course, rely on a, um, ERV air to air heat exchanger for fresh air. So that's the building part, and then there's a Again, mechanical systems, a little more detail, but this is where we're prescribing what standards we have to meet within the uh, mechanical systems in order to reach the, the mass save level. Uh, and that has to do with energy recovery for the ERV, um, very tight building, um, ducts that don't leak, and that's a, another, if they're within the the insulated cavity, that's not really an issue. Um, and then the efficiency of the heat pumps. Plumbing systems, um, we have heat pump water heaters and low flow fixtures. And then all lighting fixtures will be LED. Uh, we use Energy Star appliances wherever that is applicable. And then we've talked about it during the site that we will have EV charging in the lots. So just to uh, get back into to the heating a little bit, there's it's all electric, no fossil fuels. Um, we're going to use air source heat pumps uh, with the condenser, exterior condenser, and then 
within the building, we are looking at two different systems just depending on the size of this building and its configuration. One would be just a typical mini split, wall mounted mini split, and the other would be a, a ducted um, a, a ducted system that you know distributes the air to the rooms. So there's only one unit within the building, but it distributes the air. For ventilations, they're very buildings are very tight. The uh, range hoods will not be ducted to the outside, and the bathroom will not have separate ducting to the outside. It's all done through the ERV, which recovers um, as much energy as possible from the exhaust air. So the, the ERV will be mounted in a central location in the building on the second floor above the ceiling. There will be uh, ducts running, exhaust ducts from the, both bathrooms and the kitchen, and then uh, supply runs running to the living and sleeping rooms. Um, and then those are run continuously. That's how the uh, that's how this fresh air brought in continuously. And then for the laundry, um, depending on how things balance out, we will either uh, vent the dryers or use non-vented um, condensing dryers, which we have used on a few projects. Um, in plumbing, so as we've talked about during site, you know, it's connected to town sewer, it's water service comes in. Um, we have separate water service meter at each house and the fixtures within the building will be tub showers in the A and B homes, roll-in showers in the C and D homes, and they all will have low flow faucets, toilets, and heat pump water heaters. And then for electric, uh, we've talked about some of this in the site as well, but there'll be uh, transformers on site. Um, the the parking lot, the parking lots will have uh, their own have power at, uh, located at the mail shed that will serve uh, lighting for the common lighting, and then each unit will have their own utility meter and their own service. Um, fixtures, LED, there'll be um, fire, obviously fire and, and carbon monoxide systems in each unit. Um, and then we'll be making provisions for cable. And lastly, there'll be uh, each home will have solar mounted on the roof. Um, and their own tied into their own meter so that they their electric bill is is gets the credit for that. And lastly, we do have we don't have any major community buildings as we talked about, but we do have two mail sheds and cart storage. Uh, one of them will include a small insulated water room so that we can have a, a, a outdoor faucet for community garden. And I think that's it for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to I'll go on to discussion. Great. Ms. Allen, do you want to add anything? No? I have a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to members of the board. Um, we can do a couple of rounds of questions. So the, the first question is in terms of the outside appearance, mm -hmm. have you, you, you've settled on concrete siding, is that correct? Yeah. And you're gonna have, it's gonna vary between some vertical slabs and then some horizontal um, not right. Slabs, but what? I... Yeah, vertical. Yeah, it's so it, it, the cl horizontal is is clapboards or shingles. Yeah, um, and then the the vertical would be board and batten. Board and batten. Okay. Yeah, which Turns is all are... which are all yeah. products that are that are made by Hardy and have consistent colors. Now Hardy's the name of the manufacturer. It, but... Yeah, Hardy. Yeah, it's one of, yeah. one. Of, there are other brands, but it's basically a cement siding material. And you're not painting them. We're going to uh, use the color embedded into the concrete. We're going to use the color. So they're they're designed. They are they come painted. They're pre-painted basically, and they're designed to be. They they have a pre-painted finish, so they're designed to be used without an application of paint. So does that? We have that where I live. Um, does that paint then? Is it every ten or twelve years it has to be painted, or is this 
Like, uh, I, I think it's, I concrete. think it's, yeah, I think it's considerably longer. It's not the kind okay. of, it, it's very unlikely to peel. Um, good. Yeah. But and also, was, if you have, yeah. I was going to say that's a good thing because ours right. is peeling here a little bit and we're about 10, 12 years out. So yep. uh, that, that's a considerable savings to the, to the, yeah, the I think owners. It is. Um, so it, the EPV that you talked about on the, uh, okay, well, go, going back to the Clabberts versus the board and batten. You're going to use the board and batten primarily to delineate between the two different units in the, the shared space. Is that the, the that was well? Contact? That's yeah. That was one of the that was one. I mean, we've done a lot of studies about you know different ways of combining the siding, um, and what we kind of ended up was we didn't really want to have a we wanted the buildings to read as a building, um, and we didn't want to have a kind of hodgepodge of stuff too much. Right. So we were trying to keep it fairly simple. So. Um, but it is interesting to sort of break them down so you are aware that there's kind of the two separations. Right. It breaks the scale down. But that was the idea. Yep. And it breaks up a, a sort of a monotonous That's um, right. yeah. picture of a, not having the same building structure is one thing, but breaking up the what the duplex into two pieces yep. does help as well. Yeah. Um, color choices. Are, have you made those or are those going to be left up to the owners or how is that going to be decided? Uh, we have not made them yet there, but I'm not sure that it's a discussion, but I, I, whether or not to be left up to the owners, I think probably yeah. not. That's a decision that needs to be made fairly Early. not immediately during construction, but yeah. probably before there's an owner on board to, to pick the color. Yeah. I think part of the thought is that, you know, have a, you know, a handful, a, a small palette of colors that work well together yeah. um, and complement one another. Um, and that, you know, those colors would kind of stay and remain and probably be codified in the condo docs, right. um, so that we don't end up with some sort of hodgepodge 30 years from now. Right. Exactly. And that when they get, when they do get painted, you know, the, the, it's painted the same color. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I'll ask one more question. It's, I've got other ones, but I'll pass it on to the next, some other board members. So what what type of construction are you using? Are these going to be stick built? Are they, um, you know, modular or? And yeah. explore, explore different construction <laughs> techniques. And is there an advantage? Is there a cost advantage to, from one to the other? So we we've been talking about this from early on, and part of one of the reasons we're trying to keep this kind of rectangular thing was to leave it open the idea of doing a modular construction. Um, my experience, I haven't done a full modular project, but my understanding of it is that uh, it's very, it's pretty, there's some cost benefits when you're working in a very tight site or under a really high, tight, uh, difficult labor market, like in Cambridge or Boston, where you can just bring in something and plop it down on the foundation. Um, it's a little bit less competitive, I think, out here. Um, but it's definitely a possibility that the, right now they're kind of drawn as stick built buildings. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean that they can't be, uh, it can't be some modular aspects to them. So certainly, you know, using trusses that is, as opposed to stick framing most of it, roof is pretty simple. You, the uh, contractors, you can panelize the, the wall construction so that you're actually bringing, mm -hmm. you know, you're framing in a factory, bringing stuff off site. Um, and you bring them on a trailer and just stand them up together. Um, the other, there are other ways to potentially um, modularize parts of the buildings. There, uh, we actually have a neighbor right in Brattleboro who is developing a kitchen and bath system that would be a pl basically a plug and play uh, system that could be brought in, but have all its the cabinets, all the plumbing, all right there. You bring it in as a unit, set it in the building, and just connect it to one point. So mm -hmm. there's a big range of possibilities um, in the modular direction. So you you're we, still making a decision, as but to we haven't committed to anything. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And there's there's got to be significant cost difference. I would expect there's significant cost differences between the different styles. Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, I. I don't, I guess I would put it this way. I don't think there's a savings in going modular okay. in this kind of situation. Um, okay. 
Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to other members who have questions about the architecture. Um, Ms. Greenbaum, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. I have a question about Hardy Board. And in terms of making concrete, I understand that that's a very intensive impact on the environment. So I'm sort of asking what what the cost benefits are in terms of the environment versus using wood clapboards. That's my first question. And when they do need to be painted, can they be? When, and what is the lifetime? Does it, does it last 30 years or what? What yeah. of already board? So those are all great questions. I don't think I can really answer them that well, but um, there are there's a lot of fiber material. It's not, they're not straight concrete. Um, I don't know if you remember the old, they used to have these old asbestos shingles and everybody's yeah. dogs them, but yeah. I've, I've taken a lot of them off. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> if you look at them wrong, they they, they crack. But um, it's, it's this is a lot of fiber in it in addition to, it's not just this, you know, straight cement. Um, I think the biggest liability that it has is it is possible for it to absorb some moisture that's what I so was wondering. You do, yeah. So you do need to design. You need to design the system to keep it away from as much as possible. It's not a problem with. It's a problem if it's sitting in it or if it it splashes too heavily up on it. So you want to you want to have uh, it above rooftops held up, you know, six to eight inches. Um, you don't want to have it run down too close to the ground. Um, having a, a water table. PVC board along the ground and having it keep up is much better. Um, so this, it's not, it, it's, you know, there's things you can do to prevent. That's its biggest liability though, I think. Um, What's the overhang? Because we've run into problems with other places with building the 80s that had no overhang. Yeah, I, I think, I can't remember what we're looking at, but a little, uh, over a, like a foot and a half or so over a foot. Okay. Um, so it's something we're still a little bit looking at in terms of the solar shading also. So, um, but it's not, yeah, we don't have no overhang. Um, also uh, the buildings yeah. are fairly low so that the, especially on the one story, you know, it's, there's not much siding below extending. The down. other thing you didn't mention, which I've run into now, cause I have a new heating system and that's the electric heat is very dry on these dry cold days. Do you have humidification of the units? Uh, well, I think actually in these tight buildings, humidity is is the main pollutant that we control for. So there, there's a bigger issue with uh, with controlling for high humidity, and that you run your your um, you run your ERV basically to control for humidity. I've known uh, places that, that if if they aren't gonna have it running all the time, they'll run it on a humidity stat. So I think having the, a tight building, really you, you don't run into issues where it's quite as dry as if uh, you didn't. And I'm not sure that also electric heat is any drier than say forced air where you're you know actually blowing hot air around the... Uh... No, I used a humidifier then and I missed it with the electric. All right, I have, oh, I asked my two questions for now. Mr. White, you had your hand up next. Um, I did, Mr. Chair. Uh, this question might actually be more for Jessica. Um, so I honestly was not very familiar with the non-vented condenser uh, type dryers that were mentioned in the presentation. So I was doing some kind of researching on them while we were going through the presentation. Um, I see from what I've from everything I've seen that one of the kind of issues with this type of dryer is particularly for our target demographic for this uh, project, which would be first time homeowners. Uh, the secondary filters for those, from what I'm reading, um, and this could all be wrong, uh, need to be cleaned at least once a month. We all know how much dryer lead, to, you know, is a huge fire hazard when with the units that are going to have these non-vented uh, dryers, will there be some sort of documentation either on the dryer or included in the uh, packet on just letting these first-time homeowners know how to properly care for appliances that they may not be familiar with and may not know how to properly service? 
Sure. Um, good question. Um, I, you know, my intent in my mind, we haven't nailed down anything, but my intent and my thought is that each homeowner will get um, a manual of some sort, an operations and maintenance manual, because I think the dryer isn't going to be the only thing. These are complicated. These are complicated systems. Um, and we're, we're going to have a PV system. So there's going to be a lot of maintenance of these mechanicals that there needs to be some sort of guidebook handbook that's provided to each homeowner so that they have the information at hand. Um, that being said, it is going to be up to the homeowner to make sure that they do change these filters and they do maintain these appliances. Um, that is part of being a homeowner. You know, the great thing about this program is there is a requirement to do first time home buyer training certification that you must do in order to be an eligible purchaser. So these are some of the things that are covered during a first time home buyer class is, you know, some of these just basic maintenance things that you don't think about when you're a renter because somebody else is taking care of them. So does that answer? It does. Yeah. Your concerns? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Tom, do you have I, anything you want to add? Well, to that? I, I will just add. So as we try to make our buildings more energy efficient, it comes with more technology. And it, it is true that it really, you know, it's same with the heat pumps. You really need to clean the filters. And mm -hmm. and I, I uh, we're, we're not, there's a mass save level two that is very stringent to meet. We're not trying to meet that. I'm hopeful that we don't need to, that we can vent these dryers without using condenser dryers. Um, and still make the HERS rating. Now, um, we have some projects that in order to meet mass level two, we have to have condenser dryers in order to get the HERS. Um, and so in terms of that, I'm pretty, I'm hopeful that we don't use them because they are, there are some, they are a little finicky. But regardless of whether they're not there or not, yes, there are filters that need to be changed regularly and all this other stuff. Oh, thank you. Mr. Meadows, you were next, and then Mr. Henry. Oh, you're muted, Craig. Yes, yes I am. Um, excuse me, I've got a cold, so that I probably start coughing right in the middle. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I think you've got a great, simple design, uh, nice, easy mechanical system, et cetera. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, you take a look uh, with a good accountant at the differences between uh, the heat pump system that you're you're talking about using and ground source heat pumps. This is primarily on a tax credit basis. Um, we we've been doing a lot of analysis on buildings that we're we're working on in New York City and uh, comparing. Uh, VRF systems, variable refrigerant flow systems, and heat pumps, and ground source heat pumps, and uh, both water and air uh, systems. And because of the tax credits that are available now, the, the ground source heat pumps win out every time by a significant margin. Uh, you've got to talk to an accountant who is familiar with Chapter 40L of the uh, investment tax credit, but um, an analysis of the differential in cost may prove that you, you can have a system that's even easier to operate than what you're proposing and give you better tax advantages. Just a suggestion. Yep. You know, Valley actually is has a project where they're using ground source heat pumps um, in Northampton. It's, it's 60 unit building. So there's you know, this is a large efficiency of scale there. So there's one system that will go in and feed and and they have it in the units, um, you know, each unit has has a has a, a heater that runs off the ground source heat pump. Um, I think we, we did look at this a little bit. We didn't look at the tax credit part, but the cost part is quite different when you're looking at 30 or 15 individual buildings as opposed to coming into one building and distributing it within that. Um, but yeah, it, it, the other factor is who's going to get the tax credits, who's yeah. going to get the uh, forty uh, that uh, the the uh, tax deductions right. as a result yeah. of it. But uh, on the basis of even though the first cost is a lot higher, the 
the long-term costs are much lower. Right. So I did talk to the project manager who's doing our um, our nursing home project about this after our last meeting, because I believe you brought this up at the last meeting. He's much more building technology uh, expert than I am. Um, and one of the comments that he brought up about the ground source and having 15 separate buildings is that I don't believe there's a way to meter that ground source heat. Right. There's at this point, it's okay to do it into one building because you have one meter going into one building in order to do a metering system for 15 separate structures within one project. It's not possible at this point in time. They have not come up with that technology yet to, to measure the source of the, of the ground um, energy. So that was his comment when I brought this up to him after our last meeting, and I just wanted to pass that on. Yeah, if it was a rental or something, that would make it easier because the the um, management company or whatever could pay for the heat, and then, but yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Meadows? No. Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chalmers, did I hear correctly that? Um, the units will be almost flush with the ground. Um, there be to make it more accessible. Uh, at the entrances. So, I can. Um, the answer is the floor slab will be flush, but the framing will be up above grade. So the foundation will 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 rise up above the grade before the framing starts if that's I don't know if that's what you're getting at but it but is. at the at the entrances there will be you 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 there'll be a cutout so that you will be able to go directly in okay and um i believe you mentioned that in the mud rooms um i don't know if it was all the units or some of the units that's where the water heater would be or some of the appliances yep is that, is that correct yeah are these hidden in closets or storage? Um, well, water heating right now is the biggest bugaboo we have for all electric buildings. Um, because in order to meet the mass save levels, you can't use a, a regular water heater, a regular electric water heater. It has to be a condensing water heater. And the condensing water heaters need to be within a larger space because they draw on air. It's a air source heat pump basically and it uh it cools the space significantly but it also needs so it needs some air circulation so they can't be located in a uh you know they can't be shut up in a tiny little closet basically okay um, and they it is true that there's they're a little on the noisy side so we have a door in there and we keep that you know kind of away from the bedroom area and away from the from the living area as much as possible. Um, but it's not possible to lock them up in a tiny little closet. I mean, there could be a curtain or something, but it needs to be within a room. Was there any consideration to a tankless water heater system? Again, the the uh, there's no electric tankless that provides A, enough hot water, or B, meets any of the, it's, they're way too expensive to run. So it would kick the the energy use would would just pop us out of the out of the hers rating required. Okay. Um, so it has to be a heat it has to be a heat pump. We, there are um, the technology is changing fast, uh, but at the moment there's not a good system for having uh, interior uh, an efficient system for having an interior water tank and an exterior condenser the way you do for uh, you know, for the regular mini splits. And that would be the great thing. And it, it probably will be coming, but right now the only ones that really do that are ones that actually run the water outside into the condenser, which, and they're also meant for much larger, uh, water use than individual, individual units. Are you, so the, I'll come back to that. Um, Going back to the the, the accessible units, um, is it 
fully accessible or is it just um entrance like no I mean, the accessible yeah. units are fully accessible so they will have their kitchens will have open you know 34 inch high counters okay. uh, open under the they'll have a wall oven and a cooktop instead of the range um they will have rolling showers open lavatory no cabinet etc okay and um on the side-ins that was being talked about, um, are these side-ins able to be power washed without stripping the paint or like traditional home side-ins if they get dirty over time? Uh, depending on how the power wash is done, they're able to be washed. I wouldn't want to put a, you know, a, on any kind of piece of wood or other material, cement board, anything, you know, a high power wash, but they can be washed. This This factory applied paint is better than any paint service you could get, you know, painted onto a building. So it's really in there. Okay. Um, I believe those are my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. Um, I had a couple more. Um, go over again the insulation in the walls and on the floor. Are you using a foam insulation or what kind of insulation are you providing in that? Okay. So the on the slab, there will be a, a rigid foam insulation um, on, beneath the slab. Okay. Um, and we've been using EPS these days as opposed to XPS because it's a little bit more environmentally responsible. Um, and then the wall has uh, cellulose sprayed into the cavity and then rigid um, EPS on the outside of that applied to the studs now um, okay I, so you I, have you, you you blow in closed cell foam and then you put no no not no cellulose not closed cellulose cell. oh you plug cellulose. 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 cellulose not, yes. not foam okay no, and then you put it. a batten over that of of, of um so that on the inside material. yeah so on the inside you know they have this netting and they apply it to the stud and then they spray cellulose into the yeah. stud cavity and okay. then on the outside, there's a there's a, a membrane that we apply over the plywood. It's a sticky, uh, breathable membrane that provides the air barrier for the building. And then over that goes the rigid insulation, and over that the siding. Okay. Um, now, when you stick to one inch layer, uh, I think we got this worked out so we can use one inch of rigid. And when you do that, you can apply the siding directly. Um, to the foam, you don't need, if you're running more than one inch, then you get into having to have strappings and a secondary wall kind of situation. So, this is far beyond my, this old house knowledge of. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, things change pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's mostly for my, my information, but yeah. that's, that sounds um, impressive. Um, so does that, do they still talk about R values? Is that still a thing? Yep. Is there R yep. value to what this, yep. in, Yep, and that, that I think on that slide we we that slide on from CET that I will I will send you this package has uh, all the R values that we're trying to get. I can't quite remember what it is, yes, but then, can look. and tell me why um, I suspect I know why I think it's probably in order to get certain subsidies. But tell me why there's a HERS rating and and you have to comply with that HERS rating. What does that mean? And who's that? Okay, company? so <laughs> the first reason is that. Um, the, the energy, there's a new energy code, 2021 IECC, IE, um, and there's a stretch code applied to that, which Amherst is part of. So those that code requires uh, a HERS rating, which means there's a consultant that is uh, hired to do work on the preliminary design, which would be that report. And then during construction, they certify that you're meeting the energy levels and particularly um, that there's a air blower door test that's performed on the building mm -hmm. and to measure the air the air tightness, air infiltration rate. And they basically do these measurements and then sort of and have a report that gets sent to the building department. So it's it's a two thing. It's partly the building code and it's also mass save. Um, and the mass save, depending on what level you're going, is somewhat more stringent than the current code 
that certainly used to be the case. The code is certainly catching up to that, though. So there's both code requirements, and is there a financial incentive to have to be have a higher HERS rating than? That's right. Yep. Is that correct? There's a yep. higher. That's okay. what that that mass save is giving. Mass you save some, is that okay. giving you some money back to meet meet those levels. All right. Um, and then I I want to go back to the non vented dryer first. I mean, maybe this I know this is probably uh, kind of picky unish, but it seems the advantage of a non vented dryer is that it puts the the heated air back into the unit, right? That's right. It's not it's not exhausting air and putting you know putting a negative pressure on the on the building. And, yeah. So, and because if you're if you're blowing air out, you've got you've got to bring it in somewhere. And if you right. bring it in, you're going to be probably bring in an unheated air and is it more, are they it just seems to me that they're it's 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 more expensive it seems like you have more maintenance and yep. i'm just i don't know about the you have to do the cost benefit analysis on that and i'll i'll leave you to be uh, you to make that judgment but it seems to me you're adding potential you know potential fire hazard with having two filters that people have to change i know how hard it is just to change one and um, I don't know how much I don't know how much benefit there is to the um, to the the integrity the the air integrity of the unit to have um, the event going outside. But you yeah, know, I, I think there there I don't yeah. think there's any fire hazard because there's no it's not like a gas dryer dryer where there's a flame and it's not high heat. But I agree with you completely. It's it's kind of a if if we can meet our hers rating. In any other way, this is the last thing I would like to do because it is a piece of technology that is that is finicky. And I don't. I'm expensive. pretty confident we don't need to. Yeah. Use it. Okay. All right. Do other people have other questions about architecture? Um, Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, I would like to ask since you just brought up about the heat from the dryer. Is there a window you can open in the warmer weather? That's the first question, and the second question is. Can you open the windows in all weather? Um, for example, the inter seasons, not necessarily air conditioned weather. It's nice to open the windows. Yeah, so, so all all the windows are, are mo practically all the windows are operable. So every space will have operable windows. Um, Even be... where the dryer is, that that room, you can get the heat out in the summer. Yeah. You can. I mean, they, they're going to have air conditioning as part of the heat pump, but. Well, but you don't but want yes, to. I mean, we have, we, we, we have, you know, typical um, operable windows. They'll all be case windows. They'll be everywhere. Um, so there's no, I, we're not, we're not trying to uh, achieve energy savings by reducing the window area in this. In fact, we're, we're kind of doing the opposite. We're having increased window area on the south sides. To bring uh, the sun to, in. Yeah, to bring the sun in. They want a lot to. Yeah. Um, no other question. I had a, another question. Um, this, and this was brought up by the planning committee. One of the things that I I was impressed with was the thought of having an outdoor storage unit for just rakes and you know, things to take care of their private yard. Um, the planning board also brought this up. What's the square footage of that? I know it's, <laughs> it's it, it infinitesimal. Looks, I yeah, know. it, looks, it yeah. looks really small to me. And yeah, it is. I, I'm not, I don't think you need to have it big enough to store a lawnmower, yeah. or maybe a push mower, but not a lawnmower. But just to keep stuff outside, you know, the, to, rakes yeah. and hoses and just yeah, we're, we are working with that on that working so, something bit bigger yeah. all right i'm trying to work it's it's not we still are we're not gonna it's not gonna expand dramatically but we definitely want to make it larger it's complicated because there's habitable space over it and the way the roofs yeah. work out but um and it's, it's complicated because the door if it's if it's farther out the door banks into your heat pump or the, or the, the right. compressor and your current yep. waves so, all those things are, are there i understand yeah, but I agree. Well, we're we're working on trying to make this a, a little bit bigger because it really looks pretty small. Yeah, and just so that there's enough room to put some sh not shelves, but just post yep. up so you can hang stuff. Otherwise, yep. it's yep. yeah. Anyway, so you get what I'm talking about. Yeah, we definitely understand that. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. 
And then lastly, so when we have the two story bordering up against the one story, I think that's the D unit. Um, yep. You've got that storage space in between and you have, so is, is that on the second floor? Is yep. that storage, there's storage, uh, there's a floor and there's additional storage space on the second floor. Yep. Internal storage space. Now it's yep. not on gonna the, be, it's not gonna two, have height, height, but it would be. It has some height and on the yep. two bed, on the three bedroom, on the two bedroom, which I didn't show you the C unit, the I mean, sorry, the one and a half story, two bedroom, that actually becomes a, it's, it's reconfigured a little bit and it becomes a bedroom. It's it's just so the, the layout of those is a little bit different, but that that area is actually one of the bedrooms. Bedroom. Yeah. So then their storage area is on the first floor. The only storage they would have is that connecting area in the first floor. Yeah, they have okay. a little. Um, I think we got them some storage in there, but but I think that's actually I'm I'm glad you have storage area. They don't have a basement. They're just things you have to put someplace that you don't want to have hanging out in the house, and so the storage area just makes right. some sense. That's good. Yep. Okay. Other questions regarding the architecture or the mechanicals? I guess what I'd like to do is is raise some of the issues. I know you've had this discussion with the planning board. Um, they've written us a letter asking um, that they raised some questions and I thought we'd just go over them briefly. And I'm expected you've already given some thought. And the first is, uh, and this was the memo from Ms. Brestrup that um, memorialized some of the questions raised by the planning board. and. Ms. Brestrup, is there, if there is anything that I'm missing or that I should emphasize more, just chime in with that. But one of the things is, is lighting. And we had a little bit of a discussion about this before uh, in, a, in the last meeting, where there, you, uh, it seems to me that you have a responsibility to balance safety and uh, comfort for people, which is a, a real concern with re reducing the um, spreading of light and being um, sympathetic or, or uh, complying with sort of the, the, uh, the ethic of the area of town you're in, which is a little bit lower light, more, uh, less, less urban and more sort of uh, a kind of exurban kind of feel to it. So how have you, what have you decided on, on, the, on the light and give me the pluses and minuses of how you're, how you're looking at that? The lighting, the paths and the spine, all that. Sure. So I think what I, I can say that what we proposed is sort of the maximum of what we're comfortable with as a design team. Um, and as I stated in earlier meetings, we're happy to reduce that um, in ways that the board believes makes the most sense and still feels safe. So whether that's reducing some of the lighting on the pedestrian path, um, you know, whether it's just leaving lighting in the parking areas and leaving the the path completely unlit, you know, it, it's really, I think, a discussion for all of us as you as the community um, to determine what makes the most sense. But make, you know, we what we've presented is basically the maximum that we feel comfortable that makes sense at the site. Any people have comments about Lighting, I know there was some discussion in the past. I mean, the, the one thing is, I, I really do think that you need to have those the spines, the spine road well lit, but downcast, and it doesn't have to be 40 foot high, you know, lights that shine all over everybody's yard, but the, that you're going to have a walking path down the middle of your, of, of this development. Mm -hmm. And especially if it's in winter, you need to have people see what's on the on the, uh, the path. And I think that you know, downcast lighting low, it doesn't have to be at a high level of very tall, but I think that's really important for both safety, walking safety, as well as safety of people in the area. And there so, are bollards that are being proposed yeah, along the walking path and maybe the bollards is sufficient lighting and no additional higher lights are needed. But I still think that we do need some, some lighting in the parking area. Yeah. Um, that to me feels important. Um, again, it doesn't have to be as high of the poles. I um, I have to go back to the lighting plan to look at the number. I believe it was 14 feet is where we landed. If it feels like that we can reduce that into a, um, a smaller scale, I think that makes sense as well. But again, you know, without having lighting standards for us to kind of work off of from the community, we're kind of trying to 
come up with something that feels safe, that we're trying to make it a safe area, but we don't want to overlight it er uh, either. I mean, to me, it's important to understand that there's wildlife corridors that are behind this yeah. property and that I don't want to have too much light that inhibits any wildlife movement. So um, everything is dark sky compliant. It's certified dark sky fixtures. So I think we've presented the best that we can in terms of providing the most light. Again, we're happy to reduce that if that's the if that's the board's desire. And lastly, you're going to have a, um, an automatic system off on, um, you know, some kind of, I suppose, a solar, uh, not a not solar control, but um, it'll respond to the light when it gets dark. Okay. And motion controlled as well. So they'll get a little bit brighter. Oh, and motion controlled as well. Okay. Yep. yep. Uh, Mr. Um, Chair, so you have yep. two hands up. Um, yeah, I, I see. That. Have... I'm going to go to Chris first yep. because she might have a comment about this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ms. Brestro. So I just wanted to um, bring up the comment that Mr. Uh, Henry made last time, which really struck me because I think, you know, we're all used to wanting light levels to be fairly low, but Mr. Henry pointed out that people who move here might be moving from places where they may not have felt safe and that they, when they move here, they want to feel safe. And so um, he was recommending, and he could speak for himself because he's here, but um, it, it appeared to me that he was recommending that the light levels that were proposed not be lowered in accordance with the planning board's um, recommendation, that he thought that people who lived here might appreciate having a well-lit little neighborhood. So That, that is correct, Ms. Bestrup. Yeah, there was, that was the discussion last week. Or the last time we met. Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, I I was going to point out that I objected to the design of those 14 foot lights as being much too industrial for the, the, the more rural character of the housing. And I would like to see a different number one design. And secondly, I have an old-fashioned lantern in my front yard with, with LED lights in it, downcast, and that one lamp, which is probably equivalent to a 60 or 100 watt bulb, I don't know quite what it is, it's been so long that it's in there, um, it lights up my whole yard, the one thing, so that I don't think we need as many lights in that parking lot as people may be thinking, and I'll, I wanted to ask or make sure that there is a motion detector to turn them off so that they're not on all night long. Uh, but I, I really would like to see a different design on those lights that are in the parking lots. More domestic design. Other comments about lighting. I, I just want to add, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. I just want to add that um, to what Ms. Greenbaum is saying. Um, I, I think changing the design does not necessarily reduce the lighting. And so that should be considered if the design is going to change um, of, of the fixtures rather. Um, I don't think she's proposing and she can speak for herself, but I would no objections to the design to blend in with the neighborhood and the community, but still advocating that the lighting is not reduced. Yeah. You know, we, what we should, I haven't studied the lighting plan. Uh, um, is, what is, is, do we have that in the, in the packet? Yes. It's in the original application yeah. submission. It's page yeah. eight of the site plan set. Appendix A. So I got CA9, CA8. No. S1. So the, the first attachment, I believe, that was submitted with the application outside the narrative and all of the forms yeah. and whatnot. I got that. Um, big, oh, I, I got it here. E1. Uh, C8 is the lighting plan. 
it's impossible to read. At least I can't. But the numbers are very small. You know what? Uh, I would encourage members to take a look this, at the lighting plan. I I'm not going to take time now. Try to find it and, and go through it. I, but I encourage okay. members to take I a look it. at it. I've got it right here, but the numbers are too small to see. All right, Ms. Breastrup. Um, Lee Jennings of Dodson and Flinker is here in the audience, and she has her hand up, and I believe she was one of the people who made the lighting design, so you might want to call on her if you have a question yeah, about that. That would be good. If she could comment on the, the uh, what we've been talking about, that would be very helpful. Can you... Hi everyone, I'm Lee Jennings with Dodson Flinker. I live in Amherst and I thought I could share with you um, the slide from our presentation that also shows the light fixtures, if that would be helpful. Yep. Please do. Um, so the slide shows the, the 12 foot pole that goes along the central spine and then the 14 foot arm mount which is typical to use an arm mount at a parking lot to direct the light over the vehicles and then the the bollards for the secondary paths <clears throat> and we were trying to choose a fixture that's um kind of neutral not too um historic and not too contemporary and meet the dark sky uh requirements. Okay, before you leave that, let's just run through. We've got the dark orange is the, the, the 12 what? foot pole. Those are 12 post tops. Okay. And Correct. you've got those, those are dark orange. Yes. And then the lighter orange, are those, those are the bollards? The bollards. Correct. And then the circle with the black circle with a kind of a yellow center yes. is the 14 foot parking area ones correct and what is the what is the standard amount of of i guess footlights or the measurement you need to have sufficient light on the parking lot and on a on a pathway right so um in what the do these numbers mean and what should we be shooting for right in the absence of um town standards we went with kind of the um, IES recommendations, uh, which would indicate for this type of environment, which is not, a, you know, a mall, uh, right. that you would have a half a foot candle to one foot candle in parking areas and a half a foot candle in pedestrian only areas. So that's what we're getting across the site with no light trespass beyond the property line. So I'm looking close at this and it looks like the spine path is 0 0.05. Correct. Is that right? And the yes. and then the, the um sidewalks to the into the set the homes that are set back are also with those uh, bollards, they're also at that level, correct? Right. right. Of course there's always slightly higher foot candles right underneath a fixture. Well, but. yeah. And the, the lights right. will not go completely off at night. They'll they'll be dimmed. And then when there's motion, they um, brighten. No. Oh. Although you can, the, it can be set. <laughs> uh, you can adjust the, the settings if you want to go very, very low. You can set those ranges. But that could be the, the amount of, of um, I guess, off light <laughs> when they're off. The amount of yeah. light that, that's that can be set by the, the homeowners association at a later time. Yeah. They can make that judgment Correct. as to what they want it to be. Okay, all right. Your and Ms. Greenbaum's your objection is to the fourteen foot. You think that's too. Um, I'm like, you know, I like any of them, but the, the little ball that I can put up, but the other two are just ugly. They're not men. I would say industrial. I don't care contemporary or what, but I would like to see something more domestic and scale. 
and style. I'd like them to go back and look at the catalogs again. I wouldn't use them even in a commercial place that I owned. All right. Um, let's go on to the next issue that the um, planning board has raised. It was the vehicle. This is one that we raised as well. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to interrupt you, but uh, Philip okay. has his hand up too. I think oh, he's talking about the last it, point. It's so hard to see when you're. Yeah. You have the. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Henry. It's so hard to see who has their hand up. With uh, Mr. It's, um, sorry, it's Mr. White, Philip White. Mr. White. All right. Yep. See how hard it is to see. I can't. It's this background, but the other options. Are yeah, you're, it's even so, worse with with your background. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, as far as the lighting plan goes, uh, of course, I'm very thankful for the recommendations from the planning board and, of course, very sensitive to making sure that we're not interfering with the migratory path. But ultimately, where I fall on this is I'm going to have to be, I think, in agreement with Mr. Henry in that I think we need to make sure that we're allowing these residents and homeowners, excuse me, um, to feel at home and feel safe mm -hmm. in their homes. And I think this lighting, I mean, I think the lighting path is fine as it is. That's my you know, two cents for whatever it's worth, but. Got it. All right. Uh, vehicular traffic. Um, I mean, the one question we had was, can we make, my, my question at the last meeting was, how do we make sure that we're not having cars running down the middle on your on your spine road? And what you said that there's a bollard up with a removable chain that you could you could for you need it for emergency vehicles to be able to get through. And I'm I'm satisfied with that, but I, I think the and how do you prevent Amazon trucks? I guess the question is just that you, you keep the chain on, and only the police and the and the emergency folks can take the chain off. That's got to be the way you control it, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the that seems to be the best uh, solution. We were really trying to respond to fire department comments. Um, we did initially propose removable bollards, and they requested that we removable bollards can actually take too much time for them to remove when there's in the case of emergency. So there, it was. It, we were responding to their comments and requesting um, mountable curbs and then at least having those two granite posts. The chain can be set up if the homeowners decide that that's what they'd like to do, um, or the chain can just be taken off completely and just leave the mountable curbs. And we do have proposed signage as part of the packet as well that says this is for emergency vehicles only. Um, so it is going to be some some uh, behavioral um, watching that's gonna need to be done by the homeowners association. And it is something that will need to be addressed by them if this becomes a problem. Right. But we've given them the tools to make the decisions that they wanna make and they can- Correct. That's what's Correct. important, is to empower them Correct. to make those decisions. Correct. All right. I don't have any more comments on that comment from the planning board. Um, next was mailbox areas. I am some, I'm somewhat sympathetic to, to a larger mailbox areas because it might be easier for people to, to gather. I mean, that's a, the mail comes in at 1130 and, you know, people come out, whatever it is, they come out and gather and they, and, and as well as, um, help each other out with packages and that, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that does make some sense to me. I, I'm hoping you might be looking at. We, we can certainly look at that if that's the desire of the board. What do other people think about a larger mailbox area or mail shed? More of a community area. Does anybody have a thought on that? I I, I would lean to that. Um, yeah. But the, the other question too was, um, I don't know if this was considered yet, that the two mailbox combine into one, so there's only one unified address. Was that looked at address and, and discussed yet? So that hasn't changed since the last time we discussed the address. Um, we do intend to change the address and we've had that conversation with town officials or in town staff. Um, it will be an address on Montague Road. Um, 
And uh, but we haven't taken it any farther than having those initial discussions. We can't do anything about it until this permit is granted. So the the complexity is in order to to A and R off the existing rental home. That A and R needs to be part of this permit package, and her address is twenty forty Ball Lane. So, um, or 40 ball lane and all of her services, her utility, trash, all of those services are at that address. So I can't really change the address because then it kind of messes up the utility um, services for the rental property on the site. We could also condition um, later on that that be a requirement they do after the permit's been granted um, in, in case you wanted further assurance that that's gonna happen. Okay, thank you, Rob. Ms. Greenbaum. I think the, the mailbox area is kind of small. There didn't seem to be room for very many carts there. If a lot of people work and go shopping at the same time on the weekend, there's not going to be enough carts for people to get their groceries home. Yeah. And I agree with most of the things the planning board said. Yeah, I, I, I People have a lot of stuff, and those houses are very small. So I, I mean, I think that's something you, I, I sense there's some support here amongst board members to look at perhaps enlarging the, the uh, post office sheds for lack or the mail sheds for lack of a better term. Okay. Um, and that might make, and it shouldn't be expensive, very expensive to do that. Give it a little more function. Um, Ms. Brestra. So I think one of the points that the planning board was getting here was trying to get to was that there may be some confusion on the part of people delivering mail as to which mailbox shed they should go to. So they were wondering how is um, Valley going to demarcate one mailbox shed versus the other? In other words, does someone have to go to two mailbox sheds to get their mail every day or how are they going to sort that out? Um, so that's one of the things they were pondering. Sure. I mean, I think it's it's actually probably fairly easy. This this uh, development will have one property address and units will be assigned a letter or a number. And so those letters or numbers are um, on those mailboxes. That's how I've seen it done in other condominium developments where they have, you know, separate mail areas for separate uh, unit configurations. So um, I think that's easy enough to solve in terms of how somebody would get their mail. They would be, you know, assigned that the mailbox would be the same as their unit number. Thank you. Um, unless there's any other questions about the mail shed, um, storage sheds, we've already talked about that. I think there, there's some desire to, to make a bigger, to explore the, the uh, possibility of a bigger shed, possible common building. Um, we had, that is not something we talked about. It seems like the planning board was talking about having a, um, a location where there might be in the future homeowners could build one. I don't know why why you would need to do that now. You have well, I think the idea was during if if the homeowners uh, wanted to do this and if it was designated on the plan in like you know just a a bubble area of possible location for common structure. Um, it's already permitted and they wouldn't have to come back to the ZBA in order yeah. to build that structure. So I think that was sort of, the, it was trying to be efficient with the permitting process if that was a desire of the community to build some sort of structure, whether it's a pavilion or a shed or whatever it may be. Um, and we can certainly dis discuss as a design team where we think it makes the most sense to locate the structure within the development and put some sort of bubble or and, and you know language on there that, doesn't tie it to it, but says, you know, possible location or location for possible um, future structure. Okay. All right. Uh, we've talked about heat pumps and mini splits, um, snow storage, that it was, I think it was mentioned at the last meeting that there's, it looked like there wasn't a, very much space for snow storage. Some car, some parking areas will take up some of that snow. Have you guys given any thought to expanding the snow storage around the parking lot? No, we have not. You, I mean, I, you have how many, you have 18, how many parking spaces do you have in each of the parking lots? 15? 
Um, no, they're different. Um, it's a total of 58 spaces. Is that correctly? Right. Yeah, 58. They're right. That's right. That's right. So you got 25, almost 30 spaces there. That's that could be a lot of snow. I think you have to look at you have to look at a, where that snow can be pushed more than I, my preference would be to push the snow off to the side and not talk, take up the parking spaces during the winter. But um, I think you I'd ask your design team to, to, to do that. Snow sure, we just also have to be cognizant of stormwater regulations and yeah. where those snow storage areas are in relation to the stormwater structures yeah. um, and in relation to the wetland and wetland resource areas. So we need to be thoughtful about that. Well, so let's, can you come back? We're doing the stormwater, I think, next week. Can you yes, just, we are. You, you don't have to give us a, a firm plan, but you can give us some your thinking and what, okay. what um, difficulties you have in expanding those given the stormwater and the and the wetlands considerations. Otherwise, I think they, they don't look like they're sufficient, but there may be reasons that they are the size they are. We've talked about the maintenance, the exterior, um, electric vehicle charging. I, I, um, I guess they're just saying, how would they be metered? And I think that would be controlled by the, um, by the homeowners association and not probably not, maybe initially by your operation, but not long-term. The homeowners association. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I feel like that it's important that not everybody in the homeowners association has to pay for the cost of charging one or two persons electric vehicles. Yeah. And so I, I really, I feel like in terms of equity and fairness, it makes sense to have it be a system where somebody is paying for a charge. Um, and that it's not the burden of the homeowners association to pay for those charges. Um, I, I also think it's important to recognize that this is for the homeowners and is not a public charging station. Um, that is not the yeah. intent of it. So you wouldn't, at this point in time, you wouldn't be opposed to a, um, a condition that set required um, a subscription or pay, pay per kilowatt hour on the, on the. Uh, no, not at this time, TV. but if the, if the homeowners association, again, if they want to create a different system in the future, I want to make sure that they have the ability to do that without having to come back and reopen the permit. So yeah. some sort of flexibility in the language, I think would be um, beneficial or just being open to the idea that the homeowners themselves may decide, you know, 20 years from now, everybody might have an electric vehicle. Right. <laughs> so it may not be a, as big of a deal as it is now. Um, it's hard to hard to know what where our technology is going to be in twenty years from now. So that's true. I also um, agree with Miss Allen, Mister Judge, because yep. um, in, in thinking about this, I, I don't foresee these homeowners immediately owning an electric vehicle. Yeah, 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 and I and. But for the one or two that may, spreading the cost amongst all of them it seems to be unfair. Uh, it seems to me the most fair thing would be to have, if somebody is fortunate enough to have an electric vehicle, they pay for their own fuel. Otherwise, I'd want, I'd want everybody to share, <laughs> share their gas bills with, uh, with each other, right? Correct. Yeah. It seems to me. Um, Ms. Jennings, I, you had your hand up and you took it down. Would, did you have something you wanted to say? I was going to offer to share the the drawing that shows the snow storage, but I think it's better to wait and discuss that with the civil engineers at the next meeting. So. Yeah, let's do that and see if there is limit, if, if we can get past or see how far we can get with more snow storage and still be in compliance with stormwater and conservation requirements. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just in speaking of conservation, just so the board is aware, we did go before the Conservation Commission last night to open our hearing with them. Um, and that hearing has been continued till December 13th. All right. Do people have other, board members have other questions regard for the applicant before we go to public comment on the this application? Ms. Greenbaum. I missed what she was saying about a hearing on December 13th. Is that for uh, us? No, no, no. We'll be in front of the Conservation Commission again. Our, our hearing with ComCom was continued to the 13th. I just wanted to keep the board um, aware yeah. of our parallel permitting with another board so that you're... Thank you. I missed it. Thank you. Sure. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, if there's no other comments from board members at this time, 
or from staff. I would um, open it up to public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on the uh, on the application, the special permit application. If you wish to do so, please use the raised hand function on your screen or press pound nine on your phone. When you're recognized, give your name and address for the record. I will try to keep your comments to about three minutes. I'll try to help you do that by running a timer on my phone. Um, do we have uh, any comments? Any play with the raised hand, Rob? None that I'm seeing, Mr. Chair. I guess we have people a few more minutes, or not minutes, but I guess like five more seconds to to do that. Um, nope, not seeing any. I don't, so I don't think we have any public comment. All right. Okay. Um, I guess one the one last question I have is um, I never know how how much more detail we'll get before the before um, January when we hope to make a decision on the conference of permit in terms of the architectural drawing and the finalization of that. Um, Rob Mora, um, what, how much more do you need before from them, if anything? Um, and then I know the construction drawings with more detail later, but is this sufficient or do you normally need to get more detail coming from applicants and this uh, before final approval or a final consideration? No, th this is fine for this process if if the board's comfortable with it. Uh, you know, footprints and heights are all established, and yeah. you know that would be the parameters. Usually, the comprehensive permit will have a set of conditions that you know kind of set the tolerances for changes that can occur that might be considered minor enough for me just to approve through the kind of the final construction documents and permitting process. Uh, so it really is at the comfort of the board. At this point, so if um, I guess I'd ask, uh, where's the uh, Mr. Chalmers and Miss Allen? Would we have a, a palette by January of colors for the um, for the the units? Would we have um, a, maybe a more specific kind of uh, layout of the, how the this different clapboards versus beadboard on the different units? I, I'm just thinking about the in terms of the exterior look. The drawings are pretty good. I, I kind of like it, but it's I know I'm putting a lot of my own um, thoughts into it, what they what they look like. So I'm I'm kind of extrapolating from a, a black and white drawing what I think it might look like. So that'd be great to have some kind of color schemes or a few colors that you're thinking of and a little bit more detail on the on the exteriors. But after that, I. I don't think I need much more in terms of the interior of the, of the units. Yep. Of so just for clarification, so I think, um, and Tom can correct me if I'm wrong, but the clapboards, I mean, I think we feel like we've kind of landed on a pattern for That's those. done? Those are? We have, yeah. I yeah. Mean, we did have a, yeah, we went through a lot of different versions, I think, but we could get into some different color schemes. Mm -hmm. well, just having palette, I don't need, I, you don't need to tell me that building four is going to be, you know, uh, light brown, but, but just give me a, a sense of the palettes and that of the colors that you're going to use. So we got a feel for what it would look like. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, I think we've already pulled some color samples from the Hardy Plank um, catalogs and I've yeah. sent that to um, Tom and his team. So we can review that and just provide you with the, with the palette colors from the Hardy Plank catalog, if that makes the most sense for you. Great. Okay. Are there any other details on exteriors that you were looking for beyond the clapper design? Well, I think you, you, I'm not, but I think you okay. may want to you may want to respond to Ms. Greenbaum and see if there's alternative. There there may be one or two other ways to structure the lights. Yeah, that's up to you. Um, but she did have some questions about the the, the 14 foot post, and you may want to take a look at that. I don't have any other questions. I don't know if anybody else does. So my hesitation about messing with the lighting plan, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it if it's the, the majority of the board would like us to, but it is an expensive um, thing for our, our team to do. It, it it costs us money to hire the third. Oh, no, I'm not, talk, I'm not okay. talking about, I'm not talking about changing the amount of, 
um, what is it? Footlights, <laughs> light feet. What is, what's what's the measurement? Foot candle. Foot, foot candle. Thank you. All right. I'm not talking about changing the foot candles. I'm okay. I'm talking about. I think Miss Greenbaum was interested in a different kind of light pole, and out of the now I don't know if that's a different style, not a different amount of um, dispersion of light. Yeah. So that's her thoughts and her questions. And so I was just raising that in order that you may want to. Let look, me circle. Yeah, I'll circle, circle back, back with, with everybody and see what we can we can um, come up with for other styles. Um, we may end up having to do another photo metric plan because every, every fixture has a different um, it's different amount of light. Yeah. Different amount of light. So it, you know, that's anytime we change the fixture, we actually have to redo the plan. So that's well, what I'm trying to do. So instead of having that come up at the last minute, you know, yeah. let's let's okay. see if it's how how important that is. But okay. give us some okay. don't engage in a new photovoltaic study until you've got some kind of feel from the board that that's really important. Those are the fixtures right. that they are comfortable with. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So fixture selection first. Yes. Okay. Then, but I, I don't want to impose additional. I mean, I also don't want to have um, a hold up at the last meeting where we absolutely. say we don't like the lights. So got it. No, absolutely. Be prepared to deal with it. Yep. Yep. I'm just happy to do it. I just want to make sure that it's worth the time and the effort and the money to do it. That's all. Right, let's not spend the money until we decide that. All okay. Right. The screen bomb. Got it. The only other thing that I feel very strongly about is that there should be a taught lot where kids can play safely, little ones, and not be taught that the only place they can play is in the road. They don't have to play with fire hydrants in the road. I really feel strongly that there has to be a place set aside for kids to play that's safe. And one of the reasons I'm pushing that is there were three deer in the field yesterday, and so that means most of the places those kids have are going to be where the animals are crossing and being ticks, um, being in the presence of ticks. And I, I'm concerned about that. And I would like them to find some place where there can be a taught lot where kids can not have to play in the hay and, you know, have a place where they can ride their tricycles or whatever and not have to go to Mill River. I feel that they should find a place for that somewhere on the plan. Ms. Greenbaum, you're saying that there's something most, like most a family, bubble, yeah, something I, like a bubble yeah, that they talked yeah. about for the building, uh, you know, an area that could be decided by the Homeowners Association in the future as an appropriate spot for a playground or a play equipment or as opposed to, as opposed to um, creating one now, would that Salt, would that suffice for you that they identify an area that could be used in the future? Well, I, I was trying to say and didn't realize you were talking at the same oh. time that most of the family housing that we've approved in the past for rental housing has had a taught lot where kids can be safe. And here you're not going to have grassy area. You're going to have, you know, essentially hay fields with deer and bears taking a regular trip through for their daily meal. The bear that comes to this area goes, and this is from the video that they showed last year on Zoom, the bear that comes up to this area is the bear with the green tag, and it goes a couple of houses past mine, all the way into the Quabbin and, and um, the mountain range, the Holyoke Ridge. That, that's how much that bear gets around. I haven't seen her yet this year, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want her to come. But they are the female bears because the male bears' brains are too small and the, and the, the claw <laughs> is off. Well, that's what they said. That's what the bear guy said on the video. And Paul Blockman made a special point of telling me to watch them. Well, I, I, I always learn something when I have a on a ZBA meeting, and I've not known about male, male bear brains before. So, that's... Mr. Chair, can I just respond briefly yep. to to these comments? Yep. So, um, yes, Valley has has 
provided hot lots in our rental projects where people don't have their own backyards and their own spaces in order to play. And so providing a common area for people to gather is really important in a multifamily rental building. Um, in this situation, we have people have their own limited use areas that are their own spaces that they have the ability to play in. Um, it's really important, I believe, as part of this project is to have the homeowners have ownership of this space and to create spaces that make sense for them. Um, there are several open grassy areas that can easily be converted into play areas and play structures can be placed on them. Um, there's lots of opportunity to create areas for kids to play. And so um, we're happy to put again, a, a bubble saying this is the potential for a common um, shared space, whether it's a tot lot or a structure or whatever it may be. But I, I know that this is important to Hilda and I, and I respect her opinion on this, but I would just like the board to consider that let's allow these homeowners to build their own community and to create a community that makes sense for them rather than having us come in and dictate sort of where things should be. I think it's a more organic process and I, and I think that's important to, to consider that as part of this as a homeownership project, not a rental project. Well, I'm thinking how much it costs and they, you know, they're people that don't have a lot of money. Uh, Rob, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I guess one thing that was brought up by the plan board that I think should be included in the plans as a, pu a future, if it were to happen, that this is the area where it's going to happen is definitely that community center or shared building. Because it, that's crucial because otherwise they would have to come back and modify this permit again in the future, which would take a long time and be costly to the homeowner association in the future it takes over. So I just want to stress the importance of having that for a future meeting. It doesn't have to be the next meeting per se, but before January, definitely. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no further comments, anything from the in the either the applicant, members of the staff. Uh, Ms. Breshville. I, I note that Laura Baker um, would like to speak. She has her hand raised. She's with Valley CDC. Sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Just give us your name and address for the record. My name is Laura Baker. I work at Valley CDC. We're located at 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton. Uh, just a quick comment on colors, because I've done this a number of times with 40B permits. It's a little tricky to get locked into a color palette. Um, I think we can give some samples. One thing that does happen in the world of hardy panels is they discontinue colors pretty routinely. So um, we may not have the exact kind of colors to choose from when it's time to pick colors. So um, I just want our group to have flexibility. We will choose extremely nice, tasteful colors, I promise, um, and nice color variation. But we, I, I think it's a mistake to lock into particular colors uh, this early in the planning. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, just no other comments. I would entertain a motion that we continue this public hearing on ZBA 2024-03 until December 7th at six o'clock. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right, at that point of discussion is at that, at that hearing, we're going to deal with stormwater management and, uh -huh. um, and, and infrastructure designs. So, so it's basically stormwater, and we're going to come back with some snow and some other issues that we've raised. So that's what's coming up on the yeah, um, um, If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. It's five nothing. Vote carries. This matter is continued until December 7th. I forgot to ask Mr. Henry for his vote, Mr. Chair. Oh, you know, Mr. Henry, you're, you're, I did do that because your picture wasn't up. Uh, <laughs> Mr. I, Henry, I, 
Can I get your vote? I, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's very distinctive logo, but it's not as not as just not as recognizable as your face. It helps. It helps my internet from not going out. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Yeah. That's important. So I apologize, Mr. Henry. Thank you, Rob. All right. The vote was five. Now it's five to nothing, and um, the motion carries. Next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. And so people who wish to comment on any matter uh, that's not before the board tonight may do so now. Um, when you, if you wish to comment, please so indicate by raising your hand or pressing I'm down nine. Seeing a mass exodus of people in the attendees, uh, the <laughs> numbers dropping. This has, been, <laughs> so, this has been happening a lot. I don't know if, we're yeah. supposed to, if there's a message here, guys, but this has been happening a lot. The, the uh, public comment. We even we ran just, off my better half. <laughs> I saw the attendees, and I texted her. I said, "Why'd you leave?" <laughs> oh, that 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 hurts. That, that really does hurt. Yeah. Oh goodness. Okay. Yep. All right. I see no public comments. Um, that next order of business, I guess, is any old business. And the, I think the only old business is, or new business, excuse me, is uh, the schedule. Yes. For the upcoming, Rob, can you just talk a little bit about what we got coming up on the 7th? We have this. Yep. So on the 7th, we have this. Let me just pull up my calendar real quick, Mr. Chair. I don't have it in front of me. Um, so December 7th, we have the stormwater discussion. Um, the week after that, on the 14th, we do have one public hearing scheduled. Um, the panel still has to be selected for that. Um, it's for a um, restaurant slash nightclub type of establishment called Gabe's Underground. Um, they're going into the former Hazel's nightclub space at Boltwood Walk. Um, and we anticipate this one. Uh, I don't. It's too early to call, but it's similar to the type of use that we saw with the spoke, except they're kind of doing half nightclub, half restaurant and the restaurants can be operating normally throughout the day. And then nightclubs kind of like a weekend thing late into the night. Um, I think the total Rob correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think the total occupant number was around like 300, if not slightly less than that, like 280 or something like that. Uh, so not as big as the spoke, which had 500, um, but that's going to be on the 14th. Um, after that, the 21st, I believe that is our next uh, Valley CDC hearing for um, the various topics that I can't seem to remember fully, but you had mentioned on the schedule. I got them. If you want to read those all for quick. <laughs> property management, income restrictions, financials, application yep. selection process, and local preference. A lot of the management issues. Yep, that, exactly. Um, yeah. um, and then on the 28th, which is a tricky time because that's between Christmas and New Year's, and I'm sure people are going to be wanting to take off that week. Uh, so far, we have received an application that might have to be heard on that specific date. It's actually for a slight amendment to a comprehensive application in North Amherst at the Coles. Um, hmm. I think it's called the Mill District. Yeah. That's the name of the project. Um, sorry, that's before my time, so I'm not very familiar with that project. I believe they're getting a new commercial tenant, so they need to modify their permits. Um, so I know it's going to be hard to get people to serve five around that time because of the holidays. So we only need three members present for that specific I can hearing do day. that. I don't go anywhere. Okay, so Hilda is one member. And then um, I'm sure as we get close to time, I'll try to find two other people or maybe enough for a full panel. Yep. Who knows? But that is what we have for the rest of December, Mr. Chair. Um, and then I guess one thing I recommend is that the board um, at its next meeting on the 14th, uh, decide on a meeting schedule for 2024. And I can start putting that together um, next week when I get the time to. But um, this is usually the time of year when you look at the meeting schedule, decide the dates suffice, and then just decide to vote as a board to to go with those meeting dates for the next year. So I will get started on that and then send it to everybody beforehand so you guys can give feedback. Um, usually we do the second and fourth Thursday of every month. That's how the ZBA has always done it, uh, or at least recently since I've started. But um that's pretty much all I had, Mr. Chair, and I will be sending out that um, meeting schedule within the next couple of weeks or so. All right. Thank you, Rob. Rob, can I talk yep. to you for a minute after the meeting about the Zoom on my PC? Sure. You just stay on after everybody else leaves. We can talk about it if you want to. All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, unless there's any other questions people have, issues to raise, I think we're done for the evening. All right. 
Um, I'd entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Aye. Mr. Henry seconds the motion. This is not debatable. It's a roll call vote. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Um, vote is 5-0. The motion